2 Samuel chapter 24, starting at verse 22. The Bible says, And Aaron has said unto David, Let the Lord, the king, take and offer up what seems good unto him. Behold, here be oxen for burnt sacrifice, and threshing instruments, and other instruments of oxen for wood. All these things did Aaron as the king give unto the king. And Aaron said unto the king, The Lord thy God accept these. David, the king, in verse 24, said, And the king said unto Aaron, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which does cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor, the oxen, for 50 shekels of silver. And David burnt there an altar unto God and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So the Lord was entreated for the land and the plague was stayed from Israel. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, we just praise you and thank you for this 445. Again, Lord God, we pray for your anointing. We pray for your unction. We pray, Holy Spirit of God, that you would flow to the pews of this chapel, that you would have your way with every heart here, including this preacher. We pray, Lord God, that you would remove the calluses off of the eyes. We pray, Father, that you would open up the ears. We pray that you would open up, Lord God, our hearts to be able to receive, break up the fallow ground that's inside of us. Help us to know, Lord God, and glean from what would you have us to know today. Lord, this is your holy, infallible word. It will not return void, but it will set out to do what you had set it out to do. And so, Lord God, we are excited at the same time, Lord God. We ask that you would have your way in preeminence here today. It's in your holy name. And every man said, thank you. King David had sinned against the Lord. He made the mistake of counting the people in his pride. You know, I want to know how many people I got. And the Lord knew that pride had gotten a hold of him. And because of that, there was sin that entered into David's heart. The Lord says, you got three options here. And if you look at 2 Samuel 24, 13, and it said... So God came to David and told him and said unto him, Shall seven years of famine come on to thy land? Or wilt thou flee three months before thy enemies? While they pursue thee, or that there will be three days of pestilence in the land. Now advise and see what answer I shall return to him that sent me. So the Lord's given him three possibilities here you choose. You, you said, I've given you three ways of dealing with the sin. And David took the third, which was the pestilence of the land. And so he needed to make an altar for God that he could sacrifice. But yet he didn't have the land to be able to do it. And here he is, willing to try to make things right with God. And God said, yes, you can. But he didn't have the land, he didn't have the oxen, and so he came to this man, Aaron and I, and he said, hey, I'll build, I'll, I'll, I'll buy this land from you, the threshing floor, buy the oxen from you, and um, I'll be able to make my sacrifice here. And Aaron and I says, you know what, I'll just give it to you, king. I'll just give it to you because you're the king. And King David says, oh no, I cannot take and sacrifice without a cost. I cannot just take freely, which is not mine. But there has to be a price that is paid. He said in verse 24, he said, The king said to Aaron, Nay, but I will surely buy it of thee at a price. Neither will I offer burnt offerings unto the Lord my God of that which does not cost me nothing. And David says, it's got to cost me something for what I did. There was sin that separated him from God, and there was sin that came into his heart. And God had offered him a way out. And he says, I've got to pay this. 
And there was a law of the sacrifices that de determined what David followed. And it's that you could not offer God what cost him nothing. On uh, the same place where Solomon built afterwards and erected the temple was the same spot. But Christianity is much like the same thing. Cheap Christianity that just tells you that you could name it and call it Christianity. That doesn't cost you anything, it's not Christianity at all. What I remember growing up, and I remember my boys growing up, whenever I got something for free, I never valued it much. But when I had to work for it, and I had to work at the restaurant when I was a teenager to, to get enough money to be able to buy a car, when I finally got that used car, I valued it because I paid for it out of my own money. I had to sweat over the hot grill to be able to buy it. It wasn't given to me. I didn't earn it. But I had to work my way, and I had to work my way, and finally I got it. And my, Christianity works the same way. We give away Bibles, we give away books of John's. But those books of John's and the, and, the, and the Bibles that we give away, unless you find value in that Bible, unless you find value in that book of John, you're just going to take it and chuck it or give it away to somebody for a pack of cigarettes because it's not worth anything to you. But if you love the Lord and you love what he's doing inside of you and you want to get to know him more, you're going to value that Bible. You're going to value that book of John and you're going to want to read it. You're going to want to know who this Jesus is. You're going to want to know what he's done for you and the sacrifice that he made on yours and my behalf. You see, salvation is free. It is. But it cost the Lord his life. It cost the Lord Jesus not only his life, but the Bible records for us the brutal murder of his body and all that he went through because of our sin. And unless you see the value in what Christ has done on the cross, you'll never want to know him as Lord and Savior. But a Christianity that does not cost it's not Christianity at all. You might as well just call it something else. Uh, a Christianity that puts you in a position where you're willing to give up something in order to know Christ more. A Christianity that says, you know what? I'm tired of living the life I'm living. I want to turn from the life I'm living. And now I want to live for Christ. That's going to cost you. But that is the Christianity that will change your life. That is the type of Christianity that separates the men from the boys. It's the type of Christianity that separates the real Christians from people that just say they're Christians. Because anybody can go around and say they're a Christian. But when you're willing to put your life on the line and say, you know what, Lord, I love you. I'm not willing to live the life that I'm living no more. I'm tired of the drinking. I'm tired of the smoking. I'm tired uh, of whatever it is that's in my life that's not right. When you're willing to lay that down at the foot of the cross and say, Christ, I'm embracing your plan. I'm tired of my plan. When you're willing to come to the end of yourself and say, you know what? I don't care anymore about the things that got me and the things that I was doing in my own life, but now I want your plan. I want your ideas. I want you to live in me and change me from the inside out. When you make a determination that you're no longer alive for yourself, but you're now you're alive for Christ, now you're sacrificing. Because Christianity that does not cost you anything is not Christianity at all. You and I are never going to change and be made into the likeness of Christ unless we surrender our lives, allow the Holy Spirit in us to change us and mold us into the image of Christ. In John chapter 6, Jesus had his disciples and people that were following him. And Jesus was talking about the high cost of discipleship. The high cost of being a Christian and, and how it's not easy. 
But it's a difficult road to toll. He says in verse 55 of John chapter 6, For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. As the living Father has sent me, and I live by the Father, so he that eateth me, even he, shall live by me. For this is the bread which comes down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna, and are dead, but he that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Those that will follow Christ, those that will do the things of Christ. And in verse 59, these things said he in the synagogue as he taught in Capernaum. Many therefore of his disciples, when they heard this, said, This is a hard saying. Who can hear it? When Jesus knew in himself that his disciples murmured at it, he said unto them, Does this offend you? What and if you shall see the Son of Man ascend up where he is before? It is the spirit that quicketh, the flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. But there are some of you that believed not, for Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believed not and who should betray him. And he said, therefore, said I unto you, that no man can come unto me except it were given unto him by my Father. For at that time many of his disciples went back and walked with him, and no more walked with him. And then said Jesus unto the twelve, Will you also go away? And Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life. He had many people that wanted to follow him. When everything was going great, when everything was going good, he had plenty of people to follow him. But when he pressed into their lives and said, you know what, you need to give this up, you need to give that up, and I'm asking you to follow me, and I'm asking you to surrender this part of your life and that part of your life and those secret places in your heart that you rule and reign in and don't want to surrender over to God. When God starts asking you to give them up, people will say, you know what? This is too hard, this Christianity. I'm not walking in it anymore. I'm going back to what I was doing. And many did in John 6. Many of them walked away and they followed him no more. Because they hung on to things in their life that they thought were so valuable. They hung on to things in their life that they thought was more important than what God was trying to do in their own lives. And one thing I could tell you guys from my own life, whenever I've hung on to something that I thought was more important than what God wanted to do in my life, once I finally gave it over to God, I realized he had something so much better for me than what I was arguing and trying to cling on to. I realized there was something greater that he was trying to do in my life, and he could not do it as long as I was holding on to things that didn't mount to a hill of beans. But once I surrendered whatever that was over to him, and I could tell you story and story and story over that, then God started changing inside of me and working inside of me. But a Christianity that costs you nothing, a Christianity that doesn't tell you that you need to surrender, a, a Christianity that doesn't cause you to want to know Him closer and to dig into the Word of God, a Christianity that tells you you can keep on doing the darn same thing that you were doing yesterday as today is not Christianity. You can call it whatever you want, but it ain't Christianity. If you want to be a Christian, it's got to cost you something. If you want to know the Lord, it's going to cost you something. He gave you the free gift of salvation. He did all the work, but it's not easy. And it requires faith in order to follow him. It requires faith to believe that there is so much more that God wants to do with your life than what you know currently. There's so much more that God wants to make out of you as a man of God. 
And you say, well, all I am is just a simple man. But in the eyes of God, you're so much more. In the eyes of God, you were uniquely created. In the eyes of God, there was a purpose and a plan. Read Psalm 139. You're all unique. Every man in this room is special in the eyes of God. And God loves all of you uniquely, including me, uniquely. And he pours himself into us through the Holy Spirit of God. and wants to radically change us from who we are to what he's called us to be. But everything is called. Everything runs by faith. You've got to have faith. And there are many people who died by the hands of faith. There are many people that never saw the fulfillment of their Christian walk all the way to the end. But their lives were taken from them. And Jesus said, in this world, you will have persecution. Jesus said, I came to bring division. Because the Christian walk and being a Christian is radically 180 from the rest of the world. Being a Christian is not like anything else in this whole wide world. But you're separated, you're a total different person than the average man or woman or child. You're a prize in the eyes of God and there's so much that he wants to do with you. And it doesn't mean you can't have fun. It doesn't mean that you're gonna lead a boring life. It just means that you're separated. I do what God has for you. In the book of Hebrews in chapter 11, we call it the faith chapter. And there is a list of people who considered their life as a Christian more valuable than anything else. They were the real deal. And they gave their lives all the way to the death. And they considered it a joy to, to be in the same way delivered up as Christ did. And they looked at their lives and they said, you know what? Christ did so much for me and all he's asking me to do is walk this road with him. He's done all the work. He's just asking me to go along and tag along. And the Bible says this in the book of Hebrews in starting 11, 32. And what shall I say? For the time would not fail me to tell you of Gideon, of Barak, and of Samson, of Jephthah, of David, also Samuel, and the other prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. God did all these work in these people's lives because Christianity meant something to them, because they sacrificed their own lives for to be a Christian, because they were willing to give up their own life for the sake of Jesus Christ and to follow whatever he had for them. And he used it powerfully and masterfully. Women received their dead, raised from life to life again. And others were tortured, not accepting deliverance, that they may obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned and they were sawed asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword, they wandered about in sheepskin and goatskin, being desolate, afflicted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in dens and caves of earth. And these all obtained good report through faith, receiving not the promise. God having provided some better thing for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. God says that when you give your life over to him, you don't know where it's going to take you. You don't know where the road is going to travel. But you know it's a glorious road. You know it's somewhere that God has figured out that he should best place you based on your gifts, based on who you are. And it's not always an easy road to go. 
but he gives you this promise that he will never leave you nor forsake you and he'll be right along that road with you. He'll walk it with you. And in doing so, he'll mold you and change you. He'll put you on the potter's wheel and he'll mold you and shape you according to what he has for you. And it's a time, gentlemen, where you have to determine in your heart, I'm going to follow Christ at any cost. I may lose friends. I may lose, la I may lose neighbors. I, 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 may know, I may lose people that I've known for years. But what has it, where has it gotten me to have that life? But I'm going to sacrifice that because Christianity that doesn't cost you anything is not Christianity at all. But I'm willing to give all that up to see what God has for me. I'm willing to give that up to be able to see God work in front of my eyes, to be able to see him open up doors that I could never open up before. I, I'm going to do it because God is going to do something in me and through me that I could never have mustered in my own strength or my own imagination. But through Christ who lives within me, all things are possible. And what God wants to do in your life is totally radically different than even your wildest imagination and he wants to do it with you and I when we surrender our lives when we determine in our heart that Christianity is going to mean something to us I value my walk with Christ and I value it because it's costed me I, I value it because it's not only costed, costed things for me and opportunities for me and, and people that have known in my life but I know that God has a bigger plan. I know that God has a better plan. And I know that God is going to lead us and guide us in places that we could never have gone on our own. And I'm willing to take that chance. I'm willing to risk it all and just cast my body at the foot of the cross and say, Christ, may I be alive to my own will and all that is in me. And may I take up your cross and follow you every day into what you have. Because Christianity that does not cost you anything is not Christianity at all. You can call it what you want. But I am convinced of this, that when the Lord had said these things, that he also met this wonderful statement here in Romans chapter 8. Because he knows how hard it is to be a Christian. He knows how difficult it can be. He knows that the road can be full of of hardships, trials, tribulations. He knows that difficult times could come into our lives. And he says this in Romans 8 and 35 through 39. He says, who shall, the apostle Paul says, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness, pearl or sword? Of all those things the apostle Paul witnessed and went through firsthand. He says, as it is written for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that love us. For I am persuaded, and that word persuaded means I know beyond a shadow of a doubt. That's what the word persuaded means. That neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come, nor height nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Nothing's going to separate his love for you. He understands the sacrifice you make. He understands how difficult it was to be able to follow him. He knows that we're not perfect. He knows we're prone to make mistakes. And he's still cool with us and wanting to work in our lives. We should give him a little bit of faith and he'll do the rest. Because Christianity that doesn't cost you anything is not Christianity at all. Because when you look at the cross of Christ and you look at what he paid ultimately on the cross, he paid the ultimate price so that you and I could be set free. He paid the ultimate price so that Christianity would mean something. 
Because the Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. Without Jesus Christ dying on the cross and being a servant unto the Father and making that sacrifice, a living sacrifice. And we are called also in the book, in the New Testament, to be called living sacrifices unto God. We're called to be living sacrifices. We are called to be so much more than what we're doing. But all of it was made true and all of it came because of what Jesus did on the cross. Because the ultimate sacrifice as he hung on the cross, as he was stabbed in the side, his blood, water, gush came out. He was in agony. They wanted to break his legs, but he was dead before that happened. He was scourged. He was bleeding, and the crown of thorns placed on his head as they mocked him. He was whipped 39 times, one short of death, and bled all the way to the place where they finally put him up on the cross. He made every possible sacrifice by even divesting himself of his glory to come down to this earth to take our place on the cross. He did everything possible that you and I would no longer have to live in sin, but that you and I could live in the glory of knowing him as the Lord and Savior. He did everything possible sacrificially that you and I could be made right with the Father. He paid the ultimate price, and that was his own life, so that you and I could live. Because to Jesus Christ, Christianity meant something to him. Oh, I, oh, I know that the word Christian, Christian was not in the Bible until Acts chapter 11. I, I know that. But I also know being a Christian, you don't have to be called a Christian, labeled a Christian, you just live it. But he paid the final, and he wishes for you and I to have some kind of backbone in Christianity, to be able to walk away from temptation, to be able to be able to strive in with him to overcome. Because people will claim that they are Christians when it's convenient to claim that they are Christians. But when times get hard, when Jesus comes to you and the Holy Spirit starts convicting you of getting rid of things in your life that are not good for you, people want to flee. I, I love you, Christ, and I want to go to heaven, I want salvation, but don't ask me to give up my bottle. I, I love you, Jesus, I want to be a Christian, but don't ask me to give up pornography. I, I love you, Jesus, I want to be a Christian, but don't ask me to give up the things that I love to do that are uh, separate me from you. Don't ask me to do those things. That's not Christianity. Because Christianity, that doesn't include a sacrifice on our part is not Christianity at all. It's just a Christian walk. You want to see real results? I want to see real results in our life. I want to see God. I want to see God in this place right now, in this 445, radically change every man in this place's life. I would love to see God work in everyone's life, including my own, and change things in me and make me the man of God that he's called me to be. And, and along with that, all of us. Gentlemen, you would be surprised at the real man that God has called you to become and be. Because what you're seeing now is just an outward shell. But when God grabs a hold of you, grabs a hold of your heart, and starts doing the work inside of you, Katie, bar the door of what you could become for Jesus Christ. Let's bow our heads and pray. 
Heavenly Father, we praise you and thank you that when David had to buy land, when he wanted to build an altar, when he wanted to sacrifice unto you, he told the man of God he couldn't get it for free because it had to cost him something. He was not willing to be able to take a freebie out of it because he said in his own heart, that which does not cost me anything is not good. And Lord, I pray that in our Christian walk, we see that Christianity means something. It has a, an aroma to it when it's been bathed in faith, when it has been bathed in prayer, when we come to the point, even when we don't know how to give up things, just say, God, I want to give this up, but I don't even know how to pray for it. Just take it out. God will honor that. How many have been in this place while your heads are bowed, eyes are closed, and say, you know what? I don't know Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. If I'm going to die right now, I don't know where I'm going to spend eternity. Would anyone want to raise a hand and say, Preacher, pray for me. I want to know Jesus today. I want to know him as my Lord and Savior. Would any man, amen. I see a hand. Anybody else? Amen. Amen. Let me pray. Let me pray for you. Amen. Let me pray for you guys. And um, uh, it's a sinner's prayer. It's nothing special. But if you say from the depth of your heart, the Bible says you're saved. So you can either say it out loud, you can internalize it. It's up to you. You're just doing business with God. Heavenly Father, knowing that I'm a sinner and that you died for sinners, I receive you into my heart. Holy Spirit, come to live there and to change me from the inside out. Make me into the man of God that you called me to be, like the preacher said. Lord, take my sins and cast them as far as east as west, never to return no more. Put me in a righteous standing before you. Justify. Make me, Lord God, to know your ways. Lord, help me to stay on the road, to be in the palm of your hand and not to give things up. But when the tough get going, help me, Lord God, to stay on the road that you have so that my Christianity means something. And all of heaven rejoices over the saving of one soul, let alone five.